how many people do you know that have insane work ethic, but they will never be to the level of wealthy that you might? Buddy, right? This was Same work ethic. Number one. This was Panterism number one. The harder you work, right? the luckier you get. I mean, it doesn't mean the luck is going to happen for you. I, but, but that's the key thing that people miss. They think that hard work is going to equate to success. It's like, no, 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 no. Hard work, length of time in the game, and you still need to get lucky. Hard work is table stakes. It is. It all started with a rumor, a whisper about a private WhatsApp chat where nine-figure entrepreneurs swapped insights, information, and deals behind closed doors. And now, for the first time ever, these operators are pulling back the curtain on their clandestine world. Right here on this podcast, you're about to witness something truly remarkable. A glimpse into the minds and businesses of the world's most successful operators. So sit back, relax, and stay glued to your headphones. The chat is about to begin. Jason, start talking about May. You don't have to give any, any details, but then Matt will jump in and do his little surf story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, it's, it's, we're recording this on June 1. And, um, you know, we, had a, we just had an absolute monster May. And it's funny because there are so many things that I'm struggling with right now for us to be better at. But the numbers are so good. I don't know whether I'm being selfish or stupid, but, and look, at the end of the day, I mean, how much luck have we had in so many respects over the last couple of years, right? Matt, we talk about luck. No, dude. Your man. opinion on luck. Luck, dude, it's all luck. Like all of us. Like it's, okay, I, I've told you guys this, but look, the way I look at this is you happen to be in the water. You happen to have a surfboard. You happen to know how to surf pretty well. And then a wave came along and you managed to stand the fuck up. That's business. Like that's success in business to a T. And anybody who says like, no, no, it's because I'm an awesome surfer. It's like, no, because any good surfer knows that like you're sitting in the water for hours waiting for the damn wave. That's how Dude, it works. And Matt, what I love about that is yeah, you could be a great surfer and you you did catch a great wave, but any surfer worth the salt would have caught that wave too, right? It's just right. that most of us are sitting in traffic on the 405 and not playing in Santa Monica. <laughs> so. You know, it's like, Jason, you had a banger in May, dude, but like you got a killer product. You happen to get Gordon Ramsby. Like you happen to have like this, this monster thing called Roadshow. Like you just, you happen to have a set of ingredients that you guys have executed to the best of your ability on. Fucking kudos to you, man. Like, you have to celebrate that too. Celebrate the luck. Yeah, I tweeted out once that like it was all luck, and people get so mad, right? Because like, I know they're like, "No, luck is preparation meeting opportunity and your ability to seize it." I'm like, "Yeah, man, it's sure, hard. it's all that type of shit." You know, hard, <laughs> we all work hard, right? Uh, but if you can't just throw your hands up and be like, "Nah, man, I'm super lucky," then I don't want to hang out with you, right? You know. I don't buy that. I I think I've actually written a thread on this, on the whole luck thing. And like, you can, there is no super successful person out there that luck wasn't the major thing. Because like, how many people do you know, like Jason coming out of the banking world, how many people do you know that have insane work ethic, but they will never be to the level of wealthy that you might? Buddy, right? This was Same work ethic. Number one. This was Panterism number one. <laughs> The harder you work, right? the luckier you get. I mean, it doesn't mean the luck is going to happen for you. I, but, but that's the key thing that people miss. They think that hard work is going to equate to success. It's like, no, 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 no. Hard work, length of time in the game, and you still need to get lucky. Hard work is table stakes. It is. 100%. Yeah. You know, I think the biggest thing that for unlocking luck that I found in my life is just understanding the possibilities, right? Because I, mm -hmm. I go back to middle school or high school and there was kids who worked way fucking harder and were way smarter and they were on some sort of, they're like, yeah, I'm going to go to college and then I'm going to be an accountant and then I'm going to do this stuff, right? But they're on like a path because they, they, they didn't know that Shopify was going to be a thing and you could sell shit on the internet. People are going to buy it. Like they just never had that that knowledge, right? Like that, like that, that 
little alternative path. They were following the best playbook that they knew, but that it reaches a local maximum of like, look, you're an awesome account, you make $300,000 a year, but you're not Jason Panzer who's doing seven figure every every single day in May, the bastard, right? Uh, <laughs> It's just, awesome to see though, man. Like this is look the, 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 I think like the time in the game, like it's time in the oven is what I tell my team all the time. Like that you can't, it takes, it takes a certain amount of time to have a baby. Like I got so many analogies for this that like, you just can't force some of this shit to happen that, you know, Jason, you guys like, you know, Hexclad hasn't been at this. We've gone over it. Like hasn't been at it in so many years, but you've still been at it long enough and you've been taking enough shots let it like some of them hit and it builds momentum and like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so Matt and Jason, uh, we're going to have a guest on the podcast. She's a listener of the podcast. And a couple episodes ago, I let people DM me if they made it to the end, I took like 40 or 50 calls. It was a mistake. I'm not going to do that for a long time, but <laughs> what, uh, you know, one person I talked to, I'm not going to blow the brand up, but, um, founded it 18 years ago, bootstrapped only owner. Okay. Uh, wow. started as a, a, uh, wholesale only baby brand, right? You know, some point in the early 2010s, she said, fuck wholesale shuts it all down to zero, right? Cuts her only revenue source down to zero. And she's like, wow. I'm going to launch a website. Like, and now it's a nine figure brand crushing it still hasn't taken investment owns the whole fucking thing. She's drinking a beer on the call with me. She's just like, wow, a, a, a tough, badass lady. And, uh, if you asked her, I mean, I don't know her opinions on luck. We'll get her on. She'll talk about that. But, but t like time, years, in, man. Yeah. Time in the game. She was doing it before Shopify was a company, right? She was like, she's seen 2008. She's seen everything. Uh, and now we can look at her success and be like, oh, that's awesome. Good for you. Do you know how many low points I bet there was in that 18 year journey? Like d the decision to cut your revenue down to zero because you don't like wholesale anymore. Like it takes a, a special type of freak to make it in and you know, it's not even e-commerce or D to C. It's just brand building, right? The reason why I love consumer is the diversity of founders, right? There's people, there's investment bankers and lawyers. There's there's trash men, there, and there's just <laughs> <laughs> there's just so much sacrifice that goes into it. So, dude, you know, it's uh, it's so rare to meet a founder who's willing to burn their own house down. Like that's that's such a what a characteristic, man. Like to meet somebody. To have, we should definitely have her on because, like, someone who is willing to burn their own house down because they know that he can, they can build a better one. Oh my God, does that take balls? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like, I mean, wow. this is like staring, staring down the hordes. Like, now nah, I'm gonna win this battle, right? I yeah, mean, fucking, you know, hats that's off. impressive, man. Super cool. But anyway, we, episode eight, guys. I don't know how much of that's gonna get cut out. Uh, the operators podcast. Brought to you by North Beam. Might be episode seven. Finn, Finn seven, told me. Eight? Finn told me he's going to release a, a bonus episode <laughs> next week. He told me it's him. Okay. So we'll see. Uh, so yeah. episode seven, episode eight. Who knows? The prompt this week is we're actually. It was a great build up. We talked about how awesome it is, how lucky we are, how successful we are. Now we're going to talk about the worst things we've ever done with our businesses. So the most wasted money, the dumbest ideas, the worst hires. We're just going to go through all of the bad shit and we're still here, right? We still survived. We're still in business to make everyone just feel a little bit better about themselves. So anyone want to go first? Do you guys want to hear about my biggest mistakes? I want yours first. <laughs> I want to feel good bad. first. <laughs> <laughs> So the worst thing to ever happen to the company, and this is controversial. I'm going to talk about it. Um, we had to work with authorities. So this is a legal matter, but we sponsor a lot of YouTubers. Okay. And the way we sponsor them is we give them money, we give them product and we say, Hey, shoot a video, release it whenever. We'll talk to you later. We never know what people are going to do. Okay. Some guy decided to crash an airplane on purpose and he faked the whole story about uh <laughs> like he was he was dumping his friend's ashes or there was like a, like a whole backstory or whatever and 
it ended up that like a bunch of pilots saw it and they're like, yeah, no fucking way. This guy crashed an airplane on purpose. And at the very beginning of the video, he's like, this is brought to you by Ridge Wallet. Or like whatever. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. And so anyway, the, the FAA got involved. We, we handed over all documents and totally in compliance. Like at, I, the reason why I'm not in handcuffs, we had no idea he was going to do that, right? But let me just talk about the shit storm that, that floods in when somebody does that with your name attached. We're talking people made response videos, you know, everything, right? Um, luckily, nobody got hurt. Luckily, he didn't start a fire. He, like, he's going to jail for tampering with a crime scene or whatever. Um, but yeah, that was probably like the biggest oh shit movement. It's, it's back in the news recently uh, because he got sentenced to 20 years in prison. Um, but yeah, so that, that was, that was, yeah. what happened was he crashed the airplane, which actually is technically not illegal. I think you're like allowed to do that, but he lied to investigators and then he chopped the airplane up and he threw it in the ocean. So like, he, <laughs> oh my he, God. yeah, he, <laughs> you can't make this up. Yeah. He had, he hit evidence from, from the FBI or whatever. Um, well, that'll do it. I can go Jason or you can. I No, I hit it, Matt. Uh, all right. Worst idea. Definitely. Okay. So I'll, I got so many, man, like so many, I've been at this a while. So like so many, um, I'll give it, I'm going to go with the current companies though. Not my previous one. I did this thing called fuck up nights a while ago. That was fun. Right. Like you actually have to get up and say like the, your biggest fuck up. Um, okay. So current company when we, so like go pre Lomi, we were just PLA case. Um, we were doing some R and D we were, we had like developed uh, sunglasses eyewear out of a landfill degradable material. So we're like, we're going to, we're going to do some category expansion. We're going to launch this new eyewear line. Um, I had it like this time, this was probably like, I want to say 2019 in there. And I think this was like just after the Cambridge Analytica bullshit with Facebook uh, and I still had it in my head that we needed to launch the sunglasses as its own brand and its own pixel and its own site, its own everything. Cause like, I didn't want to fuck up the peel a case one. And I'm like, it's a different audience, blah, 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 dude. We, I wound up burning like a year uh, and a half and torching this fucking category because we didn't just sit the product under the peel of brand. We tr like we built a brand around it. It was called Sway. Uh, it was like very fashion forward. I'm like, we just, we royally fucked this up purely, I think all, all because we were like, no, no, we want to spread out pixel and f like Facebook ad account risk, which was such a, I'm saying it now and I'm like, I'm an idiot. Like this is a dumbass thing to do. And I know this now, uh, I ended up shutting that, that business down. Cause like, we launched Lomi and it wound up being so big. We had to shut everything else down and just do peel a case and Lomi. Cause like, I'm not Marty. I'm not a fucking Superman. We can run like 62 brands. Um, so that was like by, by far one of the bigger ones that was costly. Uh, biggest wasted spend ever, dude. I did this stupid thing with, I don't know. I threw some cash for peel a case at like some Kardashian Instagram thing. What a waste of fucking money. Same thing. It was like, it wound up being like a $20,000 CAC. Like it was just the dumbest thing. And I'm like, well, like, you know, Kardashians have young females as followers. Like we sell to young females. We'll just promote through them. What a stupid ass idea that was. We've all been wasn't money like on influencer stuff though, right? Like we've it's always so been easy on that. It's very easy to waste money. I think Sean, Sean has done a really good job being a CPM arbitrager or at least having goals and, and achieving those goals. But we talked about it. Influencer is like a, it's like a venture capital portfolio. There's going to be losers in it. Yeah. Yeah. You're a, not it, wrong. Yeah. And, and you, if you get excited about something, that's when you lose money, right? It's the same thing with private equity or venture capital. <laughs> like if you're, if you're a fan of somebody and you're like, we have to work together, we have to get this thing done. Uh, it doesn't mean that you, their audience is going to like your thing, right? And it's really hard for people to separate that out. Um, you know, and like, I'm an idiot too, guys. Like that, you know, our, our, you guys know this, but like uh, 
our biggest investors is Marcy Venture Partners, which is Jay-Z, Jay Brown, and Larry Marcus. It's like I, I've sat with Jay Brown and like talked about, you know, influencer, celebrity endorsement, like, and he has looked me in the face. This is the guy that runs Rock Nation. He's looked me in the face and said, like, almost none of them work. <laughs> Like, like, and multiple times he like stared at me and said, don't do it. Almost none of them work. Oh, yeah, <laughs> still for, for every, for every Casamiga or, or the rocks, alcohol brand or whatever, there's literally thousands of other ones you've never heard of. Right? Yeah. So yeah, it's rare. I want to hear about these sunglasses. Are you ever going to bring them back under, under Pila case? I, so I might, we've even got like, I've got blue light glasses that I wear, right. That these are ours. Um, I do want to bring him back under the Pila case because I'm kind of in like, we're I'm spending some more time on that brand now and it's mostly going to be, it's a product development exercise now. Like we ignored it for two years while we built Lomi <clears throat> and now I'm like, shit, we gotta, we gotta like launch some product here. We haven't done anything with this brand in two years. Yeah, Matt. I mean, well, Jason, we'll get to you. I bet you got a spicy one. So, so, so keep it, keep it in your head. Uh, but Matt. This is good for the like the operator's audience, right? Almost no 2.0 D2C brands, right? Like the Away era, the Allbirds era, have a second hero product. Yep. And I think that's because of the way the Facebook Pixel was designed to work. It finds people who are looking for wallets or phone cases or whatever. And when you add mm -hmm. a second data point, it confuses the hell out of it. And that's why... Yeah there hasn't been a successful new age brand to go into two categories. Uh, I think you were just really early figuring out that like, yeah, the second pixel would have been better. Uh, unfortunately it failed. <laughs> it just, so, it was such a, it was just like poor. I, I do think that like some part, it was just poor strategy for sure. Um, and I, I just think that like, we just mistimed a bunch of things, right? Like things we just didn't know. Um, the space is also hard. Like eyewear is very hard. Uh, like it's super personal. It's tough to do online. Um, we just like, we, you know what it is, man. I, let's go back to your previous comment. Like when you fall in love with something, it's a bad investment. Like we loved the material and the R and D we're like, shit, this is super cool. Like, this is awesome. This has never been done before. Let's go do that. When that was probably not the right first category for us to expand into. Yeah. I, everyone always tells me, oh, how come Marie doesn't do sunglasses? And I'm like, well, sunglasses are incredibly seasonal. Like the way it fits on your face is important. You yeah. know, it's just, I think yeah. there's all those things are super true. Uh, dude, people clown on private equity groups who do a little bit of everything. They'll have a, you know, uh, a, a real estate play. They'll have a fast casual restaurant. They'll have a D to C brand and they'll have like a septic company. Right. And it's like, what's the synergy there? It's like, no, there's no synergy. There's just all good investments. Like we're just in the working the calendar, group. man. It's like, yeah. they're working the calendar. They're like, I got one that's good in February, March. I got another one that's killing it in July. <laughs> like, that's yeah. all it is. Yeah. It's like, it's like, no, no, like VCs can have theses. Our thesis is, uh, good companies that we can buy for good prices. And that's how private yeah. equity really works. But yeah, it's a totally different animal. All right, Jason. All right, Jason. Away. Come on. All right, it's my turn. Um, all right, so worst idea. <clears throat> Big wasted spend we, we can do. That's a good one. I've got some good ones there. On, on the worst idea, I don't think we've been pretty good at killing bad ideas because we didn't have that many SKUs and they sell well. But we did consider doing a hex clad air fryer at one point. Oh. And I mean, air fryers, a massive, massive category. And we, we looked, we looked at it hard. You know, we started doing, taking some samples of some products that we can, we can start with. And we realized that just wasn't going to be like, we couldn't be best in class in any way by doing it. Um, so we killed it, but we did get pretty close to making a bad decision there. And I actually have uh, rumor has it that there's another uh, there is a a D to C cookware brand actually that is in the process of launching their own air fryer. So I wish them mm -hmm. luck, but we decided to kill that. Um, but in terms of biggest wasted spend ever, I got two good ones um, and they're both related to Google. And this goes back to 2021 when I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. And 
we, you know, we were leaning on a lot of agencies and contractors and, you know, they were all working hard and were pretty good, but there were some really bad decisions. When we launched Gordon Ramsay, we, uh, we got talked into doing the YouTube masthead um, for like 200K to announce the launch. And we really had no way of understanding whether that was good or not. And we just like literally just rolled the dice and said, fine do it um so that was that was 200k that i don't think really did much for us it would have been better to take that 200k and do better things with youtube um and we're actually doing way better with youtube now which is great and i know like lomi crushes youtube and and so does ridge like and my team is really kicking ass with that now so i'm super proud that this guy cam on my team was doing a really good job um the other one is even is even dumber. So <laughs> Black Friday 2021 bidding on like Black Friday deals or something <laughs> generic like that. That was just, I mean, driving tons of horrendous traffic to our site. And that was probably another couple of hundred grand, at least a hundred that we literally I don't know. I, I think we flushed it down the toilet. You guys can disagree, but that's three to four hundred grand that literally got flushed down the toilet in twenty twenty one. Um, is there an EBITDA adjustment for stupidity, Sean? <laughs> you know, usually, usually you can back out some stuff. I've backed out you a can. lot of stuff. You can you can get away with like uh, certain like we'll never do that again. Like it's yeah. not. It was like truly a like uh, yeah. No, I'm sorry, I was drunk. Like that's Dude, yeah, yeah. Just, <laughs> like, hold, hold my beer. Yeah, I was like one of those hold my beer but, uh, normalizations. <laughs> yeah, it's just under brand budget. It's like, no, that was a one-time brand budget. Um, you know, that's so funny bidding on, you know, because if you were brand new to marketing or if you work like as a VP of Walmart, that is the exact thing you would do. Like if you were like 18, like, no, nah, people are looking for Black Friday deals. I'm going to bid on that. Like we have a Black Friday deal. And like, I bet those clicks were just like so expensive because you got Walmart and Target both trying to win, you know, yeah. selling you like a washing machine or some shit. And we were like um, buying it in like really weird times, like in the middle of the night like i do not know what the hell was going on <laughs> i love this <laughs> but, but that was like That's okay amazing. wake up call i need to figure this shit out now and then we did that in like by q4 last year we absolutely decimated so it was great what well, what made you uh, ultimately kill the air fryer what was the trigger I, i'm like i love it when people i hear stories about how people say no like it's just so good to be proud of those things. You know, we just we just couldn't. I don't know that we put in really enough time into it, but you know, we sampled mm. a bunch of different air fryers from a bunch of manufacturers, and and you know, we just we really didn't like any of them, and we were just like, you know what, this is we're wasting our time here. Like, let's not waste our time. Let's focus on dropping more cookware pieces because actually, in 2021, uh, we had probably like a third of the number of SKUs we have now, and then. We launched mm -hmm. our knives in February of 22, and then we've been dropping new pieces in the line like almost every month since then. And we're just not going to sell them if they're not great. Like if we're not going to sell yeah. them, if we don't feel like they're special. And um, that's that's a philosophy that we've it's grown on us over time. And now we just are completely rigorous with it. You dodged a bullet, man. It's like air fryers. Like we were talking with the target buyer buyers oh, shit i want to say like four or five months ago and they're like i'm not kidding you the words were uh we need something to replace the air fryer we're at like a 50 percent household penetration rate in america with freaking air fryers like they're done you know like they ripped for a minute uh but they ripped so fast like it was like rocket to the moon so many people jumped into it and now they're having a hard time selling the damn things because everybody's got one and it sits yeah. in the cupboard Jason, that what's so interesting when you say that was like a, you know, would have been a mistake. I hear that and I get excited. I'm like, oh yeah, Hex got you to do air fryers. Um, the reason why I think that is, you know, I, I, I understand inside of Ridge, uh, there's a saying that like, I, I bring 80% ideas, right? I bring an idea that's like, 
an eight out of 10. It's almost there. I'll get it done, but it's not really like professionalized. So we have a lot of people around me that take my 80% ideas and make them 95% ideas, like a brand team, a merchandising team, a product team, Connor on marketing. I'll be like, I want to do this, get it done. And they'll make it good. So when I hear air fryer, I'm like, that's an amazing, that's an eight out of 10 idea, man. Let's roll with that. And what I would do is, is Hexclad a product company or a brand, right? Because to me, I'm like, it's a brand. We're fucking making a premium ass air fryer. It's going to be $600. It's going to have hexes all over it. And it's nothing special about it, but it's a brand. It's like if James Purse made an air fryer, I'd buy that too, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, so anyway, you guys totally, James Purse totally feel you. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, totally feel you on that one. Um, and we do look at a lot of things that way. Like, you know, we have our brand, but we do, we do also feel like on top of our brand, we're very focused on um, creating products or selling products that we think are, are special and unique and highly differentiated. Um, that, that said, there, there may be a couple things like that coming down the pike for sure, Sean. Hell yeah. Yeah. Appliance is also so different too, right? It's hard. Like you're getting into mechanics and electronics and like, it's a whole other world than than what you're doing now. Like so, uh, kudos to you. That's freaking dude. It takes, it takes so much more work to say no. <laughs> it's like looking at acquisitions, right? Sean looks at acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm an M and a guy, so I'm always curious about acquisitions and uh, there's a really interesting one that I was literally just talking to someone about an hour ago. And it's like, we don't have the time. Now this business is, is like nine figures in revenue. 20% EBITDA margins. It's, it's very interesting. I'm like, but do we want to, do we want to pay a big price and have to deal with all that when, you know, we're up 110% in May mm. on our own? No, no, you should, you should finish the meal in front of you, right? When that, when that growth ends up going to 2%, 3% year over year, that's when you start getting your second plate at the buffet. Right. But, uh, you That's got, a frankincense right there, boys. That's what, a frankincense. That? Finish the meal in front of you. That was so wise. <laughs> I've just, I mean, <laughs> I, I've been so guilty of that, right? I, my eyes are way bigger than my stomach, and I sometimes just got to shut up and just eat the meal in front of me. Um, but let's let's save the audience a ton of money real quick, uh, Jason. You did a YouTube. You called it a masthead buy. That's typically a yeah. homepage takeover. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This is just a PSA for everyone listening. Never do that. Amazon, Walmart, Target, YouTube, they'll all try to sell you homepage ad space. Just do, never do it. it Best unless Buy, you, like all of them do it. Yeah, unless you have ulterior motives, right? Typically what they'll do is they will increase like a Best Buy of the world. And this is just throwing it out there. I don't know if it's true or not. Don't get mad at me or sue me Best Buy. What they'll do <laughs> is they'll be like, yeah, we will buy more from you if you commit to giving our digital ad space 10% of it or whatever, because they want to show investors or presidents or vice presidents investment and growth in ad advertising dollars, right? And they just trade you margin or bigger POs to get that done. Uh, so unless you have ulterior motives, unless there's somebody making you do it, literally it's never driven a sale ever. <laughs> Just don't, don't do that. <laughs> it's very expensive display advertising without targeting, right? Because you got to think why, why does Facebook ads or YouTube ads work? And it's because there's targeting involved. You can be people that are in segment or you can be people that are buyer demos or whatever. They don't really do that when it comes to Amazon homepage. They're just going to show everyone who shows up there. And a lot of those people blindness bro they're there to buy diapers they like they don't want <laughs> all the other stuff is annoying gets in their way right um so anyway we just saved everybody millions of dollars yep listen to sean don't do what jason did <laughs> <laughs> we, we got a, we got a lot of friends who've 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 fallen for that but basically when a brand's growing really fast 
they get approached by all of these like very sexy opportunities, right? You'll have like, you know, vice presidents of NBC Universal or Amazon or Target calling you up, taking you out to dinner, being like, we're going to put together a brand building package, the same type of package Apple would have or Lululemon would have. And it might get you excited. And you're like, yeah, I am one of those brands now. Dude, they are, they are just trying to, to fucking steal from you. Uh, just stick to, stick to what worked. Nitty gritty Facebook ads fight about you know cost caps or some bullshit don't fall into those traps yeah the diversified spend thing is like such an easy one to fall into especially when you're growing fast you think like that's the best place to put money and i sean you've like said this in the chat so many times it's like until you're at max scale and whatever channel you're in like until you've hit the the like that point of diminishing return you should never spend a dollar outside of that channel dude and then yeah even this is a good North Beam moment. So North Beam sponsored this. I have been accused of shilling North Beam too hard. So they only get a little bit of a plug. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you said until you reach the point of diminishing returns for, for each ad dollar. Let's explain exactly what that means, right? So, you know, the more money you spend, efficiency will go down, right? That's a, that's a rule of God until you reach maybe a, a, a blitzkrieg level scale where you're everywhere and then the dollars don't want to do anything. But if you go from spending $1,000 in Facebook to $10,000 in Facebook, you expect the return to go down slightly, right? And when you go from 10000 to $2 million, it should still go down a little bit, right? So what Matt's saying is until you reach a point where the, you know, the diminishing return is so great that it can't be made up for in a, you know, the it's fallen off so far that it's finally caught other channels. That's when you start looking at other channels, right? Yeah, it's it incremental gross margin dollars. Like when yeah. you can, when you spend a dollar in a uh, ad platform in this case, and it cannot generate positive gross margin dollars, like in any reasonable time frame, you've reached the maximum for that channel. And it could be a local maximum. So like it could just be that your current way of spending in that channel needs to change. Or it could just be that like, yeah, you just can't feed Facebook more than 500 grand a day outside of like certain periods. Like it, yeah. it just, it depends, right? But yeah, you don't diversify until you test the upper bound of that. Yeah. You should try to raise the ceiling to, to raise that local maximum, yes. right? So you should get better at creative, better at product, better at whatever. Uh, but then really, you know, don't, try to spend money on Twitter ads or whatever until you are really fucking burning out Facebook. Then use North Beam, figure out what, what the incremental dollars are from each different channel. But you can, my biggest regret, one of them, I really wish I would have just spent more money on Facebook when it was easier. Uh, dude, I couldn't agree more. 2017, I wish I was just like punch drunk and in love with Facebook and just like dump, dumping as much money emptying my fucking accounts, like just pouring it in. Whoops. Yeah, I'm pulling up Facebook stock. I wish I would have just. <laughs> I was yeah, just looking at our spend in May, and we we're like two thirds Facebook, two thirds Meta. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it makes sense, Jason, at your size. Like that actually makes a ton of sense now. Um, like your awareness is at a level where like. <clears throat> Your Facebook is such a good demand capture tool. That makes complete sense. Yeah. You, know, 100%. You, you just said demand capture. I like to hear Sean on this one because I've been hearing that a lot lately, like people calling Facebook middle funnel demand capture. Didn't people used to say that Facebook was top of funnel? Like when did I miss the change? Why didn't I get the memo? Please explain. Yeah, this is well. That's a theory. Just me and Matt really have. We're kind of we're kind of solo I mean, on this. We might be on our own. <laughs> yeah, we've we've said it in a lot of chats, and people always get mad at us. Um, <laughs> uh, have you seen? You saw the scam ad, Sean, because um, Connor sent it to you, and you sent it to me. Um, there are these these scam ads. People are hijacking Facebook accounts and running these crazy like scam giveaway ads with Gordon Ramsay fucking out of control fucking out how of many control. now like 90 new ones a day holy just shit spinning these things up i was on do, the phone with our rep yesterday. have you tried have you thought of that can you turn this into a pr story where like you guys actually make good 
on a whole bunch of these fake giveaways. <laughs> and then you seriously, and then you go to like the New York times with like the Gordon angle. And it's like, this thing is blowing up so much that people decided to impersonate Gordon. And like, we didn't, we felt bad. We wanted to make good by all these people. Turn it into a fucking win. Get, get mainstream media. It's, a, like, it's actually very zero. interesting, but would you, are you going to send, would you send out a couple thousand Lomis? If I could would get like that? massive amounts of PR. Yeah. Like massive yeah. amounts. You know, people, people hate, uh, Facebook. <laughs> so you could definitely spend the whole thing that like, <laughs> they're like, Facebook is scamming all these people, but, but, but Gordon's got their back. Like that could, and I wouldn't send out thousands, but I would send out, no. you know, 50 or a hundred. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, yeah. it's a great idea. It's, it's actually real. Matt, very creative. Love it. Definitely going to talk about it. Um, in Facebook's defense, I was on a call with them yesterday and they appear to be trying hard to to figure this out. I'm pretty surprised that they don't have some AI that just like shuts all this stuff down immediately. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, what's crazy is you can't just be like, no, Gordon's only going to be on his account and our account. Like all other ads featuring Gordon shut them down. Like they must, ha they have to have that in the world of deep fakes. It's scary. Yeah. They don't <laughs> ask them how they handle yeah. Apple. Cause you know what doesn't happen to Apple that. Yeah, good point. Dude, well, we also are. We also. I saw an email. We are a. I think we're a top fifty in terms of spend on Facebook. We're still recording, so don't say how much you spent, but we can take it offline. Um, yeah, yeah. But they say top fifty. I believe that, Jason. I think it depends on time of year, right? So, like, um, in like January, you probably aren't. Cause all the health people will like the, the dick pills and supplements folks will show up and like the, and gym members, whatever. They just spend such an obscene amount for 30 days. But I bet you, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me that like when you're out of travel season, when you're into shopping like that, you are in the top 50. That, doubt, that would not blow me away. Nice. Is that that handsome devil, Mike Beckham, Mike Beckham showing up? I'm here. I have survived the monsoon gentlemen. I've never been. I have never driven in heavier rain. It is a, it was like a biblical flood that just opened up on Oklahoma, and I have emerged victorious. Oh, Mike, you're you're so loud, dude. <laughs> Do Dorothy, understand. we saw Dorothy fly by the window with Toto. <laughs> Mike, Mike okay. showed up to the Am operators I... podcast after fighting God. That's basically what he just said. <laughs> well, here's here's the ironic ironic part. The, the ironic part is I went to visit a, uh, they're, they're making the movie Twisters. You guys remember the movie Twister? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're making a sequel here in Oklahoma because of course, this is what we do here. And I spent like the, you know, a couple hours ago, I was on set seeing like all these buildings that they've built just to be blown up basically in the filming of the movie. Um, and then I got to experience firsthand the wrath of nature. But like the mailman, I'm here, boys. I, I don't know what I missed. I really, I trust North Beam because I know the rigor of their analytics. Like they don't, uh, they don't compromise. They don't, they don't cut corners. And having come from a finance background and being a numbers guy, I know that all models are wrong, but theirs is going to be the least wrong because of that level of of rigor it's like there's a trust when you're dealing with something with a model um the math behind it the rigor there's like a million shortcuts that can be taken i just i know them from for a long time and i then that's why i like i trust that they are they're putting the level of analytic it's like hex clad um reduce releasing a new product we're just not going to do it unless it's great unless it's innovative unless it's special and that and that's that's the approach over at north beam so that's why we really really trust the platform you are wasting a fuck ton of money by not using north beam that's my my totally unbiased opinion about this is that you know we'll spend a million dollars on on twitter this quarter I only feel comfortable doing that because of what North Bean tells me, right? I can 
apples to apples compare a North Beam, or sorry, inside a North Beam, a Twitter click versus a Facebook click, right? I can see the value, how it changes over five days, seven days. We, we look at one day click, that's kind of like our whole thing, but if you're, if, because other people look in platform, like, of course, Facebook's going to fucking tell you it's the best driver of traffic, and so is Google, and so is everybody else, right? Uh, so you, you need a source of truth for your business. All right, Jason just asked, when did Facebook stop being demand generation and start being demand capturing? What, at what point? He's like, did I miss the memo? Did you guys get a text from Zuck? Like, what happened? Why is Facebook middle of funnel now? And me and Matt have this theory. We've said it a lot of places and nobody fucking agrees with us. So, Matt, do you actually want to take the first stab? Okay, sure. Do you know, I don't want to get yelled at. You, okay, I'll fuck okay. it. I'll do it. Somebody will just text me and tell me I'm an idiot. Look, um, Facebook, I don't know when the point was, Jason, but in the last, at least for the last, like, I think the last two years, it's tough because COVID kind of made everybody shop for everything, right? Like that's the weird, we're, we're, it's a very difficult period to point to because of that. It's like everybody bought everything during COVID. So, but if you look outside of COVID, um, Facebook's entire machine is really good at identifying people who are looking for like or in market for cookware. Right? So like it you're not your CPMs Jason, for example, will look very similar to like other cookware company CPMs. But they're going to look super different from ridges. And the and even if you were to say like I'm going to go run top of funnel ads, they're going to be wildly different compared to like somebody who sells supplements. Fuck it, ask a lawyer what they pay for CPMs on Facebook, top of funnel or not. And all that tells you is that Facebook is putting you in little buckets and that those little buckets that everybody's getting put into is why it, we're, our theory is like, not even, it's like it, it is, is it's they're putting you into the cookware bucket or the kitchen bucket, like, and you're held there. And it's very, very hard to get the algo to break you out of that bucket. And that is why it's, that's why I call it, Sean calls it, it's demand capture. You're just, they're targeting people who want to buy cookware or kitchen shit, right? They're not targeting the people who are buying a simple modern drinkware, different yeah. buyer. Yeah, Matt, you're hundred percent correct. And uh, let's take it down one level deeper and then we might get to the conspiracy uh, level, but let's, let's jump into uh, this piece. What, you go to Facebook because you're looking for a return. All of everyone in our category is looking for the exact same fucking thing, right? In 2015, 2016, 2017, maybe Walmart was looking for awareness for a new app they have or a new whatever they're doing. And they were they were running top of funnel or video views or something else. But post COVID, post iOS 14, all we've cared about is Facebook's the money machine. I give you money, you give me more money, right? So everybody is is conversion optimized, trying to get last click results or in platform results or whatever. So Matt's totally right. If you're looking for a wallet or Facebook thinks you want a wallet, there's 10,000 people today that are in the wallet bucket that are going to make a purchase. All the wallet companies are bidding against each other to get that last click result, but nobody is filling up that bucket, right? It's every single day, it's 10,000 and it's actually getting smaller. So Facebook's now realizing the problem and asking people to do top of funnel campaigns. And when you're a big spender, they're coming to you be like, you should run awareness or video views or whatever, because nobody's filling that bucket. So what actually generates the demand? Why is wallets a horrible fucking category? Because all of us have wallet pixels on our website, right? The 10 or 20 wallet brands or whatever. And Facebook just knows who will complete that action, right? Who's going to flick that domino and, 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 and make that purchase. Uh, but they don't know how to get more people into that, right? People actually have to express interest, kind of like searching something on Google, intent-based. They have to get into that somehow. And if nobody's filling that funnel for them, you'll just watch a lot of brands die. And I think that's why Facebook gets hard over the next couple of years because nobody else is investing in the top of funnel. Um, you know, so, it's funny when people argue with us, Sean. I'm like, uh, the first thing I want to ask them is, so, so do you believe that Facebook created all these other campaign objectives for shits and giggles? Like yeah. that's the fucking objective was like, you know what we should do? We should fire up video views so people can spend money on it. 
for video views. It's Dude, like, it's, no, it's, it's to move it's, you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the coal burning problem, right? Like, you know, the world will not uh, get rid of greenhouse gases or burning coal or whatever until China and India do it, but they're not going to do it because it's cheaper. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's, there's, there's no point doing anything in an in industrialized society if people are still burning coal in Africa, India, or China, or, or emerging markets, right? And the reason why I make that analogy is it's the exact same thing. Everyone's looking for the money machine to work, but they're sitting around being like, the money machine's getting worse. The solution is we all have to invest money in top of funnel, right? Ridge to that with influencer campaigns or word of mouth because we have millions of wallets out there. Uh, but nobody else is, is doing that. And that's why it's going to continue to get harder. There's less fish in the sea. There's less people looking for wallets. And the reason why I know me and Matt are right, and if you're listening to this and you think we're wrong, I'm going to say, fuck you. Stop listening to my podcast. No, <laughs> no, no, tell us so we can get smarter. Don't listen to Sean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the reason why I know this is right is Facebook has a metric that they don't share externally. It's called uh, share a voice, right? So they, they, they put you in little buckets. They'll give you five or six or seven or eight or 10 different advertisers to compare. And they'll tell you your spend versus their spend, right? And they put it all together. And it's like, yeah, this is roughly who's spending the most, right? And, and that's your share of voice. Uh, our share of voice was 90 plus percent, right? But as we pull back on Facebook as a channel, right? Because we don't want to play this fucking game anymore. Uh, our share of voice goes down and that's where I know everyone else is really suffering because now they're, they're, they're having to generate their own demand or whatever. And Ridge is having the best year ever. Highest efficiency, highest sales, just fucking cruising. And I know everyone else is suffering. So anyway. I'll every time I talk to you about this stuff, I want to cut spend. Like every time I talk to you, I want to cut spend. And you told me something earlier this year, which which we did, which is like, let's reduce our overall spend in kind of non-sale period, non-demand periods. But then there are certain times when, you know, you really you step hit. on the gas. And that that's what we did in May. We were pretty good about laying off the gas in March through like mid-April. But we stepped on the gas in uh, in May and it worked, it crushed. So it's now like, what do I do in June? It's like, June is going to be hard. June is a harder month in general for us. So it's like, man, I'm really tempted to call the team and be like, we need to cut spend drastically in June and just like, see what happens. You know, it's the nice thing, Jason, too, is like, you get really nice baselines when you do this stuff too. It's not like you need to do it forever. Right. Mm -hmm. But like it, child, it's, because the funny thing is when you challenge someone, any, any media buyer is going to hate you for saying that cut spend, right? Because their job is to spend media dollars. But the right thing for the business is to actually figure out like how does the business work with the, like the least amount of spend? Like what is the baseline? How much organic? How much word of mouth? How, mu how much of this shit is just powering the machine? And, well, and it's impossible to know, right? It's impossible it, to even know what the lift you're getting is if you don't know what the baseline is, right, Matt? Yeah, so like it's just weird that people aren't willing to like test some of this stuff. We're willing to test creative and landing pages. We'll pour fucking major bucks into all this stuff. But nobody's willing to just like not spend the money and see what happens. Right. And we did it on Amazon. We did it on Amazon and we've written about it extensively. Yeah. Like we, we had a period where we went from almost 10% of revenue being spent on marketing on that channel to zero. And, you know, I, I think we've documented it pretty extensively, but what we really learned is exactly what you'd expect. A lot of that was just setting money on fire. It was, uh, you know, things like advertising on your own product pages where people are using ad advertising links to hop between your different listings to decide which of your things they want to buy. Don't want to pay for that advertising frivolously on our own key terms where people already had indicated that they wanted to buy from us. Um, and, or another situation that happens a lot on Amazon is you'll advertise, I'll put you top of, top of page and then you're the second organic result. So somebody who would have clicked on you anyway, clicks on the, you know, the ad because it's, it's just a little bit further up, uh, up the page. Um, and I think where we came out to is like, there were some really good in that platform. There's some really good ways where you can use ads to drive incrementality. But like you said, Matt, if you don't understand what your baseline is, if you don't really understand your metrics without ads, it's not clear to me how you could even, uh, establish what the lift is. And so then you know what people do. 
they just say, well, it says it's a five row S and that's mm-hmm. good. Five's a good number. And so I, it's, it's funny because we're so much more advanced in some ways and yet so much more primitive because everything's so algorithm driven that we live off these dashboards and numbers, but we don't know how they're coming together. You know, we don't really mm-hmm. know how uh, the, the sausage is getting made. And as a result, uh, yeah, that five ROAS had a whole bunch of stuff in there that was already going to happen anyway. So it looks good, but it's it's a vanity metric. It doesn't really count. I mean, the one thing I'll add on the Facebook front is like, listen, they have declining usage. They're not really growing the eyeballs anymore. And if you're not growing the eyeballs, but you're running a business that Wall Street expects to grow your bottom line, what are your options? You can cut overhead, right? You can cut cut heads, which they have done. Or you can find a way to cram more impressions on a page and get people to pay for it, which Facebook has done. Or you can charge more for each impression that you show. And that's what's happening here also. Like we think that because it's like a market, right? It's a competitive market that that means that the market is really setting the CPM. That would be true if Facebook didn't control the inventory. Facebook controls how many impressions there are, they are. So mm-hmm. they have this really powerful hand in the market and they need those CPMs to gradually go up over time or their profitability is not going to go up if they're not growing the number of eyeballs or usage. So that's part of why the money machine's not working as well. Facebook's got to take a bigger toll. They're a business. They've got to grow their bottom line. And so the, the perverse incentive, like in one way, Facebook and, and the advertising platforms, they're incentivized to help businesses win. And that's great. The perverse incentive is that they're kind of incentivized to help us just enough, right? Like there's no reason for your companies advertising on Facebook to get a three row as if you can get them to spend it a two and a half. And there's no reason to give them a two and a half if you can get them to spend it a 2.25. And so Facebook doesn't have a lot of incentive to help, you know, your brand or my brand hit a blowout ROAS. Doesn't make them bad, just makes them a company, but people need to realize that. Mike, I I have a lot to say. There's a lot of I agree with. Uh, the first thing is, let's go back to Jason cutting spend. The, the uh, rule zero for a company is spend money when people want to buy, right? Why do the dick pill companies Matt was talking about spend in January? It's because that's when people want to buy. They don't spend in October, right? So you should figure out the natural rhythm of your business, right? That's what we're talking about, Jason. And if you're saying June's hard, why spend when it's hard? Spend way more when it's easy, right? Yeah. Uh, that's that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is. What Mike is saying is 100% correct. People think Facebook is God. And it's like, no, Facebook is the, a modern advertising platform, right? That is publicly traded. And the only thing I will say is I had the exact same take as Mike throughout 2020, 2021, 2022. I gave speeches about it and everyone fucking threw eggs at me because I was I was predicting the fucking the, the decline of the big beast. But what I will say now is Facebook, I've never seen a company committed to getting better right? They are so committed right now. And you're totally right. They've added everyone on earth. How are they going to add more people? They're not, right? But what they are going to do is steal usage away from TikTok, from YouTube, and from TV. I do think people will spend more time in that platform over time. There'll be more ads, but you're totally right. It's a race to the bottom. They want people to spend at a 1.1x. Can you survive at a 1.1x? No, probably not, right? They will find people who can. They will spend until. So, what every about the hour. argument? What about the argument that we don't want to cut too much because we've got to keep traffic coming? You know, getting people in the funnel to maximize Q4. But do I think, Jason, think- that's a, that's a consideration window question, and that's brand by brand. Yeah. Do you think someone getting an impression in June is going to remember that and consider it all the way until December? What, hey, Jason? What did you have for to eat three days ago, dude? It's like, <laughs> it's like, no, our brains, our brains suck at that. What you should do is spend a well, fuck ton of money in October. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. But Matt, you, got, Lomi must have a, a pretty long consideration period too, um, because we do. <laughs> like, we, we have six a months long consideration to a year. Period. Yeah. Well, our AOV is similar to yours, right? Like your four or five, six hundred dollar purchases. So, like, people really think about it. Um. Well, not all of them. I would say like 20% of our customers just buy when they find out about it. It's like, fuck it, just buy it. Um, 
but most are like long consideration windows. It's actually why I like objectives that aren't purchase conversion, like OCPM, right? Because I can go on YouTube and I can run CPV and I can get people to, like I, I posted this in another chat that Sean and I are, like I can get people to watch a two minute video for like a, f a fraction of a penny. Like, a, like that's it, a fraction of a penny. And I can get them to watch a two minute video. It's so like, I would rather spend those dollars, which are way smaller. And I can, I get like right now, I get 140,000 people a day watch a 30 second to a two minute video for Lomi. It's such a and great it point. It's yeah. it, we talk about cost per impression, but like cost, uh, what we're really trying to buy is people's attention. Yeah. And if you've got somebody's attention, Matt, for 120 seconds, that right. is like, infinitely more valuable than, Hey, I got an impression of half a second as somebody was swiping through their feed. And so it it's, it, that's the kind of nuance that often doesn't get talked about, but I think about it the exact same way. How inexpensively can I buy attention with the people that I want to talk to? That's the goal. Yeah. So it's like, this is targeted spend. I'm not going broad. I'm not saying, Hey, YouTube, go spend it wherever you want. And they like, they'll dump dollars in Pakistan or something. It's not, it's like, I'm targeting like in market audiences, they're shopping for appliances, they're renovating their homes. Like these are people that we typically see. Um, but in my slow periods, that's what I do, Jason, is like I just want the cheapest possible way to get them to engage. And I think like the thing with conversion optimized ads is like we're going for the click and the buy. So the algorithm is looking for people who are clicking and buying. It's what makes them so expensive. But like, Warm, warm it up with other objectives, move them over, over time. It's way yeah. cheaper. And I'll just, I'll just add that media buyers tend to be win more type of people, right? Yeah. Like, like they, like they have no frame of reference if a 13 X row as, or a two X row is, is good, right? It's, it's just whoever they talk to and Jason, your business could run into 10 X row as like, just because of how special you guys are. Right. But you have a media buyer who's used to working on something like Ridge and he's running a two X row as, and he's like, guys, we're at four X. We're crushing it. And right. by, by win more, I mean, they'll keep their foot on the gas all the way until they like, they have to lap opponents or whatever, but a win is a win. 51% beats 49. Um, you know, I, I, uh, Sean, I don't know if you and I have spoken about this, but like in the land of meta ads, I also sometimes wonder if on a category by category level that they actually have like, what they would consider a good ROAS. Like the platform has decided that, you know, if you're selling wallets, it's like, and you, I can get you a 1.1, just say thank you. Or Correct. if you're selling cookware and it's like, you know, the average in the cookware is 2.2, .2, it's like the algo and the platform like optimizes to that number, right? Absolutely. Like it's so hard to break away from that number. Absolutely. Like, it wants to know, it wants to know, Hey, what is yeah. the point where people will stop spending? It's and I'm going to go all the way up to that line, right? Yeah. I'm going to go to, I'm going to step all the way to the line. I'm going to spit over it because that's what maximizes my revenue, my profitability. That's their spread. That's my job. That's their yeah, margin. Absolutely. Right. Now, now, now we're getting into conspiracy theory territory. I met a guy two years ago who ran 300 <laughs> Facebook ad accounts and he's like, he showed me a spreadsheet. He's like, I did the math. He's like, he's like, Facebook just wants a certain dollar amount per click. He's like, he's like, we can talk about increasing our click through rate all the time, right? Everyone wants a higher click through rate. It's better ad, whatever. He's like, I have found uh, statistical significance that increased click through rates have higher CPMs. Why would that be, right? So, if you think about that. What that means is Facebook's still charging the exact same amount per click. You could run a horrible fucking ad, but you get a lower CPM than if you run a amazing ad with a high click through rate, you get a very high CPM. And he's like, because Facebook really just wants a certain amount of money for every person leaving the platform. That was, that was his thesis he showed me. And that's conspiracy theory territory that it doesn't matter what you do. You're paying a click for a click for a click. Can I give you another but weird I don't one? Even, how is that even conspiracy theory? Like, I mean, that's got to be the model, right? We project we're going to have 8.5 billion hours of people on the site, and we need to monetize it at this rate in order to hit the projections that we have. And so we know that people will, on average, spend this much time. And when they leave, you know, we need to get this much back or the numbers don't work. I mean, isn't well, that the business model? 
Yeah, but yeah, Mike. So think think about that through the frame of the entire marketing industry that's telling you to <laughs> test creative, test audiences, to test sure. landing page, and it's like, no, dude. Facebook just like, no, all clicks are three dollars today for you. It doesn't matter what yeah. you do. Run yeah. any. The better you are at the job, the more we will charge you. Right. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a weird one. Um, so I do have a. This is like I, I know it. And I've seen it. I, I do know a company who has a room with computers in it, many of them, like hundreds. Um, each one is on its own internet connection and its own IP address, VPN to a different place in the world. And they run their ad accounts. There's separate ad accounts on each machine. And their because, theory... Go ahead. I, oh, I was just going to... I was going to get to the theory. No, I'd love to hear it from, from you. Yeah, their theory is that... Uh, is that this, so they're, they're all of this built on this idea that it's not malicious, right? That it's incredibly difficult for human beings to design um, incentive systems that are like comprehensive and that cover a lot of bases. Like it's really hard. So what Mike is saying is kind of what these guys are saying. It's like their theory is that the model, Facebook's model is actually not that advanced. There's a bunch of rules designed into the system because that's what humans do but that there's lots of holes in the system. There's lots of arbitrage. There's lots of ways to work around it. So one of the things that they've noticed is that like, in again, they spend, these are, so this company spends like, I want to say it's like high eight figures on ads on meta. So it gets a lot. And they're, I, if I say the industry, then you're going to know who it is. So like that this for them gets them the most efficient CPAs is by running tons and tons of ad accounts. But you can't do it with like the same visa and the same computer, the same, like you actually have to make it look like tons and tons of competition. Because their theory is, well, Facebook's designed for the long tail of advertisers. Let's go play into the long tail of advertisers. They want yeah. lots of cool guys to win. <laughs> right. Um, I shit you not. This is the, this uh, they built the well, whole fucking room. And if you're if you're Facebook, you're not incentivized for Sean to utterly destroy everyone that wants to advertise on wallets. It is not in your favor because it kills the market, right? You're incentivized to have competition and to have people bidding against each other because that drives up prices and keeps things healthy. The Amazon marketplace is the same way. They want you if you're the best vendor. Like we're the biggest insulated drinkware supplier to Amazon, and they want us to be really great, but they put a governor on us, like in a similar way, like I could probably show a statistical significance that like, there is a point where they're like, we're not letting you over this amount of market share, you know, like, oh, on this key term, you were ranking number one organically. And then at eight o'clock, you go to 58, you know, oh, you hit your cap for the day, boom, we're tanking you. And, you know, I've seen it in a bunch of different ways, but it's just this idea that like, they simultaneously are trying to promote competition. And if you have a really strong hand that's going to eventually discourage everybody else from competing, that's not in your best interest. <laughs> Matt, I was going to guess it's Marty. Was it Marty who has the room bill? Because that seems like something no. Matt, the guy would It do. sounds like something he would do, though. No. Um, it and totally like, sounds like something Marty could build a system for. <laughs> yeah. But my, I wanted to agree with Mike for a second. Um, you know, kings don't want powerful knights, right? And like, you know, it could be that like, you know, Facebook. Who are you to today? <laughs> what the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll explain it. I'll explain it. Uh, the Frankincense is. <laughs> like, my God. Keep going. Chaucer over here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, and like, you know, it could not be malicious, right? Facebook could be like, no, we just want everyone to win a little bit. We want the small guy to compete with the big guy. And we're, we're building these tools for everybody. Or if you're Amazon, you're like, no, it's very bad for me if I have one vendor who has 20% of, of my sales, right? You know, Anchor, they're, they're in electronics. What if they get a drinkware? What if they get another thing? What if they're so good at Amazon, they just dominate the entire market? And now Amazon's actually the Anchor store. That's very bad for Amazon, right? So, so mm -hmm. you know, Amazon is, is, is the king. We fucking, we, we all play on his land, but he doesn't want powerful knights, right? He wants... Rich nobleman, which is what Mike is, right? But he doesn't want someone who can actually, uh, you know, challenge him. Well, he's here's me kissing the ring. The 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 uh, kissing the ring segment is me saying, listen, this isn't even about these people being good or bad. Like the businesses are great; they're impre they're impressive, incredible what they've built. It's just if you're going to play in this space, 
you need to understand what game everybody you're working with is playing and how they win and then map how you win in a way that also coincides with them winning because anytime your interests run counter, I mean, listen, I'm really proud of the company we've built. If my interests and Amazon interests run counter, guess who's going to win, right? Mm -hmm. Like if my interests and Facebook's <laughs> interests run counter, who's going to win? <laughs> exactly. Well, okay. Maybe Hexclad. We'll take them down. Who knows? But I just think, being good at the game starts with understanding what game is everybody at the table playing and what does it look like for them to win and how do I win within that? Because that's like skiing downhill as opposed to running uphill if you're doing something. different. No, yeah. You, you bet on the hot shooter on a craps table, right? So it's like, yeah, let's, let's, I want to win when Facebook wins, when Amazon wins, like let's, let's get on that team guys. Uh, and yeah, kissing the ring. Look, I love, I love Facebook. I've had the best year ever with Facebook. So I don't want to say anything that makes Zuck mad, dude. Thank you. I appreciate it. Getting great CPMs and CPAs. <laughs> uh, Amazon, a little, little more lukewarm, but I still love that business. Um, all right, Mike, we're going to, I once, I once wrote Jeff, a, an email to the, at the Jeff at Amazon, literally telling him your business has changed my life. And it was true. Like my life is dramatically better because Amazon exists and they created the marketplace. And so like, you know, he didn't respond or anything, but I hope he sees messages like that because, you know, we all know there's plenty of crap that comes with starting a business and people are going to have, you know, perspectives on how you should run your company. But the reality is all four of us, our lives are immeasurably better as a result of the companies that these people are built. I'll text Jeff. I'll make sure he gets that. Uh <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Sean. When you guys are hanging out at the pool, will you just let him know? I appreciate it. Dude, it's not even our lives. It's, it's our employees. It's, I mean, it's, it's everybody, everything we've built. I mean, the, the, talk about growing a pie, right? Like uh, Facebook mm -hmm. grew a pie. It's made more millionaires than anybody else. Amazon grew a pie. It's made more millionaires than anybody else. Uh, you know, my success didn't really come from anybody else. I mean, may maybe we're selling less wallet or like we're taking wallet sales from somebody, but to me, the, the pie is growing. What Jason's doing with Master and Mike, what you're doing, we're, the, the pie is so much bigger. So hell yeah, man. We should, everyone wants to fucking dunk on, you know, even the Shopify's of the world, right? Uh, we're, we're, They're so important. Yeah. Yeah. We have our problems. We're big spenders and vendors, but uh, at the end of the day, we couldn't do it without them. So. Mike, tell us the worst thing you've ever done for your business and we'll end it on that. All right. So there's so many stories to choose from. Um, here's, here's the principle. I, I, will, I will make you guys feel good. The, here's the principle that I've learned. Uh, I have a very sales mentality. We grow the business by growing sales, right? Not particularly crazy. And we've grown in an omni-channel way with online, but also mm -hmm. selling into mass physical retail. Uh, Sam's Club, Target, Walmart, this kind of stuff. The number one mistake I've made is out kicking my coverage. And I've done it several times where I've gotten a buyer excited enough about an idea that they went really big and our brand just was not big enough to support it yet. Uh, like uh, one of the stories in 2016, we started selling drinkware, March, 2016. April of 2016, I had a meeting with a buyer at Sam's Club. She was over the sports and recreation and licensing. At the time I had that meeting, guys, I had probably been a part of selling about two or 3,000 water bottles total, <laughs> lifetime. Was able to sell a 200,000 two pack. Uh, I, program of water bottles and another 250,000 two pack of licensed collegiate licensed tumblers. So in, in total, it was something like a 900,000 unit order. And we had sold like 3000 in our lifetime. Obviously this is a really egregious example. And in some ways we were able to, to take that and build the company off that, but it also led to a program, the, the program first, the first one with the water bottles, like didn't even come close to the sell through it needed to, and was an absolute disaster. In fact, at one point in a spirit of partnership, we agreed to buy back a million dollars of inventory. I mean, so like, this is the first year for us to buy back a million of anything, a million dollars of anything was like an insane idea. 
And we bought back a million dollars worth of water bottles because they had bought that. And even then they still had to mark stuff down. There were two packs of water bottles at one point selling for like $5 in clubs <laughs> because they had so much. It was like a, you know, like a, a plague from Exodus of like how many water bottles there were. There just were so many. And we, they ended up, a uh, oh man, the extras that we bought back, they sat at our 3PL for, I don't even know, you know, like five years. In fact, they'll still pop up every now and then. Uh, but even since then, we have had some other situations where we've got the right idea, but a buyer, we get a buyer too excited or a buyer has too aggressive of a sell-through rate that they want to hit, a monetization that they want to hit, and we say yes. Or the, this is kind of related, a buyer says, hey, we really think this will do well. And all of our internal data says it won't, but we roll with the buyer's gut. Almost every time that's gone poorly. And what I've really learned is, you want to grow, you want to be aggressive in, in selling, but you have to be realistic about where you are as a brand. I talk to, just like you guys, I talk to a lot of people in our space, especially people that the idea of getting into mass retail or getting into retail is an attractive idea of here's how we're going to, we're going to grow. And quite frankly, a lot of them are just not ready yet. The brand is just not at a place where they're going to be able to hit the numbers and the sell through. And they're more likely to have a bad experience than a good experience, even if they can convince a buyer to put it on shelves. And this is the, you know, the, the truth about mass retail is don't do it until you're ready, because if you do, you'll end up losing money and it'll be a bad experience for you. So learn from me, stupid over here. Don't outkick your coverage. Be realistic about where your brand's at and what you can sell uh, and gradually lean into it. And then over time, you can build something really special. That was great, Mike. Uh, quick question. Does the buyer ever take responsibility when they say they want something and it doesn't sell? Uh, <laughs> the, the, best one, on. the best ones do. The best ones really do. I mean, sometimes, okay. sometimes no, but the best, ones, the best ones really do and really do have a partnership mentality. But they're also like, kind of think of the buyer. The buyers are amazing people, but they work for a corporation and the corporation, it cares about the bottom line. And the corporation's perspective is always going to be that it's your fault when things don't go as planned, uh, unless proven otherwise. And so you just have to be prepared for it, that it's, it's part of the game. And the way it works a lot of times is like, let's say you sell an end cap for the summer and the end cap goes live and... Uh, something happens like a bunch of stores don't set it on time, don't put it out on time. Well, the the retailer is now like, hey, we've got to do some markdowns because we've got to sell through it by this period. And so we need some money. And you say, well, it's not really our fault, right? Like, hey, stores did not get this product out and we can't control that. And when it was out, it sold really well. It would have sold through. Um, and the buyer says, that's fine. But to give you the same program next summer, I'm going to need some money. And so you say, okay, well, maybe we do need to give them some markdown funding because that's, that's the way that the game, the game is played. So it's, but, but the best buyers really are partnership mentality. Guys, that's next week's episode. We're going to go through all of the terminology of oh, wholesale because yeah. yeah, like, so, so Mike just said markdown funding. What I understand that to mean is Target is going to mark down. I'm just picking on Target. I'm not saying Target did this for you, but Target is going to mark down your item and then you have to pay them to offset that discount. That's uh, it. Yeah. And, and, and Mike's like, hey, but guys, this is your fault. They're like, we don't care. You're going to pay us for the discount. Uh, what, what Ridge has and what we do, because we're trying to be a premium brand uh, or perceived as a premium brand, is instead of letting people discount, we will buy back any inventory. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's made it really easy to go into any wholesaler because we're like, hey, if it doesn't sell, we'll just buy it back from you. Like there's no risk for you. Yeah, guaranteed um, sale. They love those deals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's really hard to do when you're a new company or you're counting on the money from it, trying to make a profit on wholesale or shipping 500,000 units like Mike did. <laughs> it's, you can't just eat that. Um, we want to thank North Pier for sponsoring us this week's deep end. Uh, I, uh, you can, you can DM Jason and he'll take a call with you. So Jason, it's so nice <laughs> of you to volunteer. <laughs> Next week's Matt. We got to, that's Mike. Uh, uh, this has been awesome guys. Operators podcast. I'm glad Marty's not here anymore. Uh, and I get to, I get to be back on the pod with my friends. It's good to have you back. Last man. Time. Yep.
Welcome back.